Great. Uh, so I'm Colin Slater. I'm the Deputy DM Subsystem Science for LSST. Um, I'm going to give you a sort of overview of where LSST stands, um, where we're going, and how we're going to deliver this, this telescope. Um, so just first, on behalf of the entire project, it's, it's great to have this meeting here. It's great to see all these people um, excited to start thinking about science with LSST. Um, there's a lot of nuts and bolts that goes into building a telescope like this, and sometimes it's, it's easy to get lost in the engineering, but um, meetings like this really bring us back to the science that we're going to uh, deliver when we have this telescope operational, and that's really exciting to start thinking about like doing science. Um, so the goal of LSST is to be the state-of-the-art survey of the 2020s. So our goal is not just to sort of add more mirror, add more telescope, uh, add more camera, and do the same thing as we did um, in previous surveys. We really want to aim for delivering the science that's going to be really impactful in the next decade. Um, and that's more than just hardware. Um, like we can, we can build the hardware, we can go take the images, but I think to deliver the top-notch science, it really requires a shared understanding of what that science is going to look like between the scientific community and the project. Um, we have our ideas about how we can do this, but um, the, the scientific community is really the people who are on the cutting edge of what, uh, what we want to research uh, with this telescope, and so we need to sort of have that interaction in order to deliver uh, really top-notch science. Um, just to highlight a few of these examples of places where um, the, under, the shared understanding between the project and community can really uh, be very important is that, I mean, obviously this week we're here to talk about the cadence of LSST. Um, we really value the community's input on that. Um, in 2019, we'll put out a call for letters of interest for alert brokers. So these are the, the organizations that will set up software that will receive the full stream of, the, of alerts, so thousands of alerts um, uh, coming in sort of every 30 seconds or so. Um, and we need to, uh, we, uh, we want to develop with the community a set of brokers that really meets the needs of a variety, wide variety of science cases. In addition to alert brokers, there's all sorts of infrastructure that would support those alerts downstream of the brokers. So um, say I want to just get my favorite top 10 objects. What's the software I need to do that? What do I need to do to look at the alert stream to have a sense of um, just kind of do exploratory analysis on the data without committing to something large like um, uh, receiving the full stream? Um, and then light curve tools. So we'll have, this is, light curves are a lot of data. It takes a substantial amount of tooling to be able to process those and to be able to make those practical uh, things to work with. So I can, I could talk about the telescope, but actually I think it's more fun to show this video that the project recently uh, put out. So the telescope is under construction right now in Spain. They built a model of the pier and they built the telescope on top of that pier in the factory so they can test it, move it, uh, run it as if it was in operations. Um, and then they'll disassemble it, uh, put it into boxes and ship it to Chile and reassemble it there. Um, so right now is right at the final acceptance testing. It's built, it's ready to go. Uh, we just need to test and make sure that it meets all the requirements. Uh, right now we're underneath the pier, so we're looking at, that was one of the motors that drives the uh, telescope in azimuth. The big orange boxes are capacitors for power. Um, this is looking up through the mirror at the camera, so the yellow, all the yellow things are just mass simulators, so the camera would have been up there looking down on us, but we don't have the camera in the factory. Um, a welding machine. Uh, my favorite part here is though um, after this where we can actually see this telescope move. So it was a big journey for us to go from uh, just a bunch of drawings on paper seeing an actual several uh, hundred ton machine move and point and, and spin. And really the, the, one of the exciting parts of this is just how fast this thing can move. So the idea is to be able to offset by three degrees take another image within two seconds of, of moving to that position. So the, what this telescope is designed for is to settle very quickly. It's very short. It's not going to, to oscillate around when you point at a new position on the sky. We want to be able to, ray, we want to, be able to take a new telescope within uh, two seconds of that 
uh, slew end. So that's it going at full speed. And azimuth, I think it's about seven degrees per second, so it should spin th full 360 degrees in 45 seconds, 50 seconds or so. Um, so soon we'll be able to have that actually in the dome, uh, ready to go on the sky, but for the moment it's just in the factory. Uh, just to see what the mount top and chair looks like, we saw a picture of, of this earlier, but uh, the dome is still under construction. You can see that most of the, most of the uh, structure is already built there. Um, there's a few more pieces of it still laying on the ground in the foreground there. Um, and then once that's up, they'll all get cladded in the surface, um, in the exterior cladding material. Um, this was meant to get done before uh, winter started in the southern hemisphere, but then winter kind of slowed the progress and makes it hard to work on top of the mountain. The, um, oh yeah, the, the big white spaceship structure to the right is the support buildings that have houses, um, a clean room for the mirror, sorry, clean room for the camera, mirror recording facilities, control rooms, all the uh, uh, computers on the summit. That's basically done. It's just getting filled with hardware at this point, um, and we're installing everything we need for it. This is the camera as it currently exists. So on the left, you see this patch of sensors. That's actually nine 4K by 4K sensors arranged into what we call a raft. Um, so this raft gets built together, so they're sort of as close together as possible. Behind each of these rafts is a big tower of electronics. It sits inside of the raft's footprint, so you don't have to lose area coverage in the camera. Those rafts and their electronics get put into these cells here, and this big thing is the grid, so that's the actual structure that will integrate the camera together. So each of these rafts will sit in one of these little bays in the grid with all of the electronics behind it. So the sensors are being delivered, the grid is finished. We see in the middle here is a set of, it's a, um, these are engineering mock-up sensors, so testing our ability to position these sensors as close together as possible uh, without bumping into them. Bumping into each other is very bad in this case, so a lot of effort goes into making sure those get positioned precisely. Um, this is an image that just uh, appeared recently. This is the first lens that goes in front of the camera. There's a few chromatic effects that need to be corrected with lenses. Uh, you can't really see the lens itself, but you can see the holder that's holding the lens on the outside. It's a meter and a half diameter. I believe that is the biggest lens in any telescope. If you know of a bigger lens, let me know, but this is bigger than any of the Schmidt corrector plates. Um, we can't find a bigger lens uh, that I know of. So, op so those optics are also being delivered, coded, and integrated. Um, we have about 200 sensors in hand. I think a few more of those have already appeared, but this number might be out of date. Um, those all get uh, put together in New York, um, sent to the camera team in uh, into Rafts, and then sent to the camera team in uh, California. And they're also building the cryostat and the refrigeration system. So that's the current uh, piece of work on the camera. Um, and then once the refrigeration system's ready, they'll be able to install the, those sensors into the grid itself. You also might hear about ComCam. This is a single raft, so nine sensors that'll get its own cryostat. We'll be able to put this on the telescope before the full camera is ready. That means that we will be able to point the telescope, see all the sorts of mechanical tests that you want to do with the telescope. Um, we'll be able to do that earlier while the camera is still sort of in progress, in production. And then once um, the camera is finished, we'll be able to swap out the commissioning camera for the real thing. Switching to data management, um, so there's many components to data management. I think the, the part that's going to be most visible to the users is what we call the LSST Science Platform. So this consists of the portal, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and a set of web APIs, and I'll talk about those a little bit more, in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, those are your front end to the LSST data. Um, they sit in front of a variety of different systems, so databases to hold the catalogs that, of, of the processed data, um, all the imaging data will be available. And then in addition, you also have user, uh, space for user-supported data, so uh, 
your favorite catalog that you upload and want to cross-match to the LSST data, we'll be able to support that. Yeah, sp space for storage for whatever science you need to do, um, and a variety of software tools and com computing capabilities. These databases get fed by the alert production system. This is what runs every night, every 37 seconds when we take a new image, we difference that image against a set of templates and we use that to produce a set of alerts on anything that's transient or changed. I'll talk about that later also. Um, so that's, that feeds into these databases that you can access through the science platform. And also the data release production system. So that's every year we will reprocess the entire set of data that we've taken. So in year 10, we will reprocess 10 years of data, extract the sort of the best view of that data with the best calibrations, being able to use all those repeat visits of the same fields to, in order to extract sort of a really clean sample of objects to do um, science on. All this runs on a tremendous amount of infrastructure. Uh, we recently had the, the fiber optic link from the summit all the way into the U.S. was turned up, so we can we have uh, plenty of bandwidth in order to support all these use cases between the U.S. and Chile. To look into the LSST science platform a little bit, so the aspect that people are probably going to interact with first is what we call the, uh, the portal. So this gives you the kind of exploratory and visual analysis. Look, let's look at the latest image that was taken. Let's browse around the co-edited images to see my favorite object in the sky and also able to browse through the catalogs that are produced to see um, what the data looks like. We expect this to be very exploratory, just a first look at what's, what's available. Uh, one usage that we, that we will support in LSST is to go a step further than just that exploratory work and to also be able to run your own science code on the computers at the data center next to the LSST data. So we'll enable this with a set of Jupyter notebooks that will be hosted in the same data center as the um, data releases. So this gives you access to all of the data. It gives you access to the data management tools that we've built. So you can both look at the catalogs with whatever your favorite catalog tools are and also uh, process, reprocess the images if you so choose um, to see, well, what if we tweak some things about the software that was used? Um, and all of these are supported on top of a set of web APIs. So every, every API we use to access the data for the science uh, portal and for the new Jupyter notebooks, you also have access to that on your own. So you can say, have a programmatic way to say, give me, my, my, give me the light curve of my favorite 10 objects every night if, if they were observed. Um, so this gives you the same access that we have um, in the data center. It's all via IVOA uh, protocols. So we've recently been integrating these systems together. So we have a prototype of the data access center. This lets us make sure that those, those systems all work together seamlessly. And we're also uh, beginning the, the testing of this at serious load. So the databases at the moment, we've ramped up to about 100 terabytes in the databases. We have a distributed database system over many computers. Um, but that's, that's just a fraction of what we need for supporting the first data release. So as uh, we progress in construction, we continuously ramp that up. So we'll be up to sort of 500 terabytes um, by DR1. And we also deployed uh, the Jupyter Labs, the Jupyter Hub, so those, those hosted notebooks, we've been using those to provide uh, easier access for users to try out data management tools. So this is something that supports uh, the, the Stack Club, which is uh, a kind of a working session by a group of science collaboration members where they're, they're sort of learning how to work with the LSST software uh, collaboratively, and that's running on the science platform uh, to enable that easy access. Uh, you can find more about that by Googling for LSST Stack Club. Um, I'll just highlight a little bit about data release production since I think I'll focus mostly on alert production after this, but there's a few new algorithms that we've been implementing. Um, one that we've turned on recently is a, a new deblending framework. Uh, I know that the TVS group has been interested in, there's been a uh, uh, deblending work uh, or um, blendedness 
uh, working group. So they might be interested in understanding the new deblending algorithm. You can find the details uh, at this link, or I can tell you about it later. Um, we've also been uh, implementing ways to make very clean coads. So say we have an asteroid. You see these little trails here. Um, if that gets, gets into the template, we don't want to have those turn up as alerts every single time we take an image of that piece of sky and then difference it with that template. Uh, so we, uh, we use the entire history of the images to identify anything that's moved or changed that in the template, remove that from the template, and then give us very clean uh, image differences to detect new transients later. As I mentioned earlier, the alert production system is what gives us this nightly stream of new detections of transients, moving objects, and variable objects. So the, basic, the premise of this is, is similar to many other transient surveys. You have a science image that was taken tonight. You have a template image that was derived from a variety of images that, that were observed over the history of the, of the observatory. So you build this, the template to be very clean. You do, you convolve the template image to have the same seeing as the, P, as the uh, science image. And then the difference of that gives you um, a way to detect anything that is new or changed or varied in brightness. And so anything that, that, uh, anything that, that differs by more than five sigma will appear in this difference image. And we'll use that to send alerts on. We'll combine this with a lot of history information, so it's not just that information alone. Um, we've had this image differencing capability for a while. You can go try this out, particularly if you have um, hypersuprime cam or duck cam data where, you've, where you have overlapping images. We can run our image differencing pipeline on that um, and look at the results uh, straight away. And we've really been working on filling out the capabilities around that. So. Uh, one problem that exists for, uh, for surveys like this is differential chromatic refraction. Uh, blue stars and red stars will be refracted slightly differently on the sky, and that depends on where they are in the sky when you observe them. So in order to make those not appear as transients, if it's just a, a constant brightness star, we need to do some corrections to account for that chromatic refraction. That's now implemented. We're also implementing association inside of the databases. So we don't want to just give you that alert and say, here's flux whatever at this part of the sky. We want to also tell you, oh, and we've also observed this five times in the past 12 months. And in those five previous apparitions, the flux was this and this and this. So we want to give you that entire history. That requires making a whole bunch of, of very rapid database calls, um, extracting lots of that data, and then packaging it up into the alerts. Um, and then we've also been doing a lot of work to validate this to make sure that we're not, we can do a nice image difference and that's, that's very nice, but we wanna make sure that when we're doing this for a thousand images every night, we don't have 1% of those images producing a whole bunch of spurious detections. A 1% effect is, is uh, pretty serious when you're talking about the amount of data that we have at LSST. So we need to make sure that is fully validated, works in all conditions. And then we're also load testing that distribution system. So those thousands of alerts um, don't overload the software we have and doesn't break down in the middle of the night. Um, just to highlight quickly that um, I think it, sometimes it's a little difficult to think about this alert stream in the abstract. Like I can think of, oh, I want to do this, this, and this. But it's, it's kind of different to think about it on paper versus to actually have data to look at. Um, and so I think a great way to really visualize and, and think about how we're going to do science with LSST is to think about uh, the Zwicky transient facility. So this is a survey where one third of the data is completely public. And so that gives you a very similar alert stream to the LSST. It doesn't have the same depth. It's a much smaller telescope. It doesn't have quite the same, it's not quite as rapid uh, of a cadence, uh, but in general it's, it's quite similar. And so they've been distributing the alerts from that uh, from that facility uh, with the same alert distribution technology that we've been using for LSST. Um, and so I think a nice way to, to visualize this is uh, Las, Las Cumbres Observatory set up the system called MARS, which stands for Making Alerts Really Simple. It's my favorite acronym. 
Uh, but you can just go to mars.lco.global and they'll give you a list of all the alerts that were seen in the past few nights with uh, ZTF. And you can go click on those alerts and get sort of a real concrete sense of, oh, here's, here's what a, a realistic sample of detections looks like. You can view the science images and the template images and the difference images and all the properties that they measure about it. Um, so I think this is a nice way to, to kind of prototype the things that we're going to think about with LSST, but on a survey that exists now, and so we can actually uh, get our hands dirty soon. Uh, this is just uh, the official schedule, so this is on the LSST website. You can look at this in more detail if you like. Uh, I think the key numbers to take away are that we're about two years away from ComCam, so that first camera where we'll be able to um, put, yeah, sort of actually collect uh, images from the telescope itself. Um, that will go into a period of commissioning, so we'll be sort of working out the mechanics of it, working out the data flow, very sort of engineering-oriented. Uh, then we'll switch to the real camera about after a year of that. And then I think the key date here is to think about science operations starting in uh, the start of fiscal year 2023. That means October 2022 um, is the nominal date for that. Um, but that's when we, so we still have a significant amount of schedule contingency, but that date is really when we expect to be able to turn on and start doing a kind of full normal science operations day, to, day in and day out. Um, okay, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the white papers and, and why we're here. So I assume most people have seen the, the document describing the call for white papers. If you haven't, there's a link here. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few bits of this uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So. We're opening this up to suggestions for cadences, but there's a few basic properties that we have to follow. So the main one is the wide, fast, deep survey. That's the main survey that observes the same field twice in a night in 30 minutes. That pair of 30 minutes is what gives us the solar system objects. And then we'll come back to this field and, uh, three days later and give us that cadence um, over the entire observing season. The requirement is for this to cover about 18,000 to 20,000 square degrees. When you do the math on that, it works out to about 85% of the observing time, 90% depending on the exact details. So that's, that's sort of a fundamental requirement that we have to stick with. Um, the other fundamental requirement, and this, there's very few except for these, which is that we have four fields that were decided as deep drilling fields many years ago. We did this so that those fields could get observations from time-limited observatories. So Herschel followed up these fields. Um, they're mostly deep cosmological fields that you don't, you've all heard of. Cosmos, Chandra D Field South, et cetera. So those, the centers of those fields are fixed, uh, but the cadence is not. The cadence is still something that we can uh, work on in this call for white papers. We want to understand what's the right way to observe those fields. So there is, I could write down just like an enormous list of questions that, can, that we could all uh, try and answer, but just to highlight a few of these, I mean, one of the prime ones is what does a deep drilling cadence look like? So I want to extract whatever my science case is from those individual deep drilling fields. How do I need to do that? Um, I think how do I want to get colors from the deep drilling field is particularly important. Do I need to do filter changes back to back to get really closely uh, uh, spaced uh, data in two different bands. If so, that's pretty expensive because filter changes take time. So how do I balance that with the need to get lots of observations and keep a very efficient observing schedule? Um, we can, there's still uh, a lot of questions of area coverage. So beyond those four deep drilling fields, we could position other deep drilling fields on particular targets of interest. Um, Right now, they're mostly focused on cosmological fields, so if there's other options, so uh, you can imagine Magellanic Cloud, you can imagine low extinction regions, bottles window, things like that. Um, these are all entirely fair game for white papers, and, and we really welcome those types of suggestions. The galactic plane is another uh, important question. The cadence there is, again, pretty nominal. It's just sort of 
here's the thing that we you tested to make sure that the survey worked as a whole, but uh, we, we fully want the community to tell us how to optimize that observations in the galactic plane um, to do their science. Um, the problem is that like in the galactic plane, you hit a confusion limit if you keep co uh, co-adding it uh, for 10 years, but there's also many option, uh, many, uh, uh, there's a lot of time domain science that's available in those fields also. So uh, I look forward to hearing people's opinions on that. And another important question is uh, what we call snaps. So the current plan is to take two images immediately one after another. So 15 seconds and then close shutter, read out, open shutter, take another 15 second exposure. Um, that gives us, that's what we call one visit, is that pair of 15 second snaps. Um, how does that help your science? We really want to know um, what impact that has. That could give you impact information on very, very fast transients. Um, if so, I'd love to hear about it. Um, we kind of designed that initially for engineering reasons, but we want to make sure that we're extracting as much science from things like SNAPs as we possibly can. Uh, so really our goal is to enable a wide range of science cases. That's why we're trying to make this as open as possible, get as broad of feedback as we can on what the LSSC cadence should look like. Just so you know where this is going, the, um, the Science Advisory Council will be, they'll be the recipient of all these. That's a, an advisory committee that reports to the director of LSST saying, hey, we think these are important science cases. Um, we think you should prior, prioritize supporting these uh, uh, white papers. So they'll, they will sort of vet those and then it'll go to the project staff who will um, build additional simulations of the LSST observing strategies so we can see um, uh, what that looks like in practice. So um, if you suggest, oh, I want these particular fields, we also need to balance that off against considerations for how does that impact the observability of the rest of the wide, fast, deep survey. So we want to deliver a survey that works on both the special programs and the wide, fast, deep together. And that really, that really requires running these simulations. So we want to quantify the results that's uh, delivered in the LST survey as a whole. It's totally okay to submit small proposals. We're not asking people to, to, to write down the entire plan for all observing of LST over 10 years. It's totally reasonable to say, hey, I just want, I really want U-band data, or I really want these few fields to get observed in um, a particular cadence. This, these don't have to be decisions made for the entire duration of the survey. We can do special programs that last for a year, two years, produce the results, and then we go to a different type of special program. So all of these are uh, available options, and we really expect to be able to merge a lot of these together. So you want this deep drilling field, these people want this deep drilling field, we'll put those together into one cadence, do a simulation of the entire thing, um, and then report on the results. Um, so, so we're happy to, to merge proposals, uh, but it's also, it, it, it serves you well if you're able to combine a wide variety of science cases. So if you have your favorite field and it serves both this type of object, this object, this field, this, uh, this, this science and that science, that really makes a strong case when we go to the Science Advisory Council and they sort of tell us what's important to do. So the deadline is November 30th. Um, I look forward to learning a lot about everybody's science cases over the next few days. So um, with that, I'll just close. Thanks. For, uh, for your talk, but uh, I, I hope that we are going to have time during the next few days uh, uh, to discuss the, the technical details. But there are a number of uh, issues related with, with the white papers that are not clear yet. Uh, in the sense that uh, we can have a strategy for the cadence, but if we have to produce end-to-end uh, -end everything, which means uh, synthetic images, reduction of the images, running the LSST software to perform the photometry, this is something that we are not going to cope in one month. There is no way for doing that. 
I, I totally agree, 100%. We are not asking people to run the OPSIM cadences. We're not expecting people to have proven necessarily all aspects okay. of the cadence. We really want to, to be a kind of high level, these are my goals, these are the type of observations that would suit my science the best. Sure. We, we, we can already have some uh, custom softwares uh, for, to demonstrate uh, that uh, the cadence that we would like to have, mm -hmm. but we cannot do that uh, end to end. I, I okay. Yes, that's, that's totally really, understand. That's really a, a very good starting point. Right. The second one is uh, whether uh, you already have uh, uh, solid uh, suggestions concerning the observing strategy. Just to be more specific, you are saying that uh, every three days you are going to visit the same field. But uh, these uh, consecutive uh, visits are going to be in different bands. What, what is uh, the kind of uh, strategy that you are planning in changing the filters uh, to cover the same, tar the same field uh, in the six bands? I don't have that information off the top of my head, so I'd have to go ask the people who run the OPSIM to know exactly what they programmed into that. Uh, that's a great topic to write down in a white paper. Though. Okay. Um, so I, this is still not uh, not covered in the in the stone. Is it something that is a matter of discussion? Yes. How the yep. different bands should be sampled? Yes, definitely. Okay. So last question, and then and then we we will have time. I am pretty sure. Uh, when you are talking about uh, the filter used uh, per night, mm -hmm. is it something that is not going to be changed over the entire night, or you can think about uh, to change uh, once, twice, or is going to be something that uh, uh, you do not plan to do that for calibration purposes? For cal we, we expect to change the filter many times in the night. Is that, is that the core of the uh, question? Because uh, this, uh, this was, uh, uh, at the very beginning, this was, uh, was not allowed for calibration purposes to have uh, always, uh, for the entire night, uh, the same filter. Oh, oh, you're asking if, there's, if it's possible to keep the same filter the entire night? Yeah. I've never thought about that. Okay. Let's think about that offline. If I may, I think the proposing for a single filter for the entire night would be very unpopular for a number of different science cases. So I think, I don't think there is any technical constraint to make it happen, but I think it's extremely unlikely to be um, a winning strategy because the, the science cases would be very, um, the science cases that would benefit from it would be very few. But the changes of the filter is precisely the kind of things we are proposing for, right? That's precisely what makes the cadence. And other than the, the hard constraints on the total number of filters over the lifetime mm -hmm. of the telescope and the overhead uh, of changing the filter multiple times, there's freedom to, to propose all sorts of things. Completely agree. <laughs>